Good Juno. Good evening. Hello, guys. Good evening, Sean. Hi, guys. Lou. How are we good? Yeah, I'm mm. pretty lovely. Yeah, a bit tired, but that's because I work too hard and do too much of the gym. Yeah, you guys? <laughs> too much of the gym. I need to go to the gym. Oh. Uh, I've been I've been for a well man test, and they say that uh, I'm uh, uh, pre diabetic. Oh, that's better than being post diabetic because they usually <laughs> <even> dead. <laughs> Aren't um, we all pre diabetic, really? Uh, well, I, I think uh, writing a cookbook w- wasn't the best thing for my body. <laughs> Sixty <laughs> recipes has not been good, but normally I do keep myself fit. But uh, well done, Ash, getting down to the old gym. Um, I don't. The only yeah, the, the old man thing. That's not where they sort of like um, get you to touch your toes and sort of like um, yeah. Yeah, it's all Dixie. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not fun, is it? Well, it's all right. You know, at least you know where you, <laughs> you know where you are in the world. Then you know what you got to do, what you're not got to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you're not going to shake hands with a bastard until he's washed them. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the only gym I visit is Bean. But, uh, is what? Jim Beam. Jim Beam, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good one. Love it. Mm. No, but Love I did start it. swimming again this week because it's been quite hard because I injured my shoulder before Christmas um, last year and uh, it's taken a long, long time to heal. So I went swimming and it hurt a lot. So I've got to really kind of push through it a bit yeah. to to, yeah. Um, to try and at least build some muscles up around it. So yeah. I'll get used to the pain, one of the two. Just like turning pages. It was turning pages. Now, funny enough, I used to work for a company and he sent me out to change a wheel on a van that had two tonne of oil on the back of it and it fell off its jack. So I, it knocked my arm and it, I oh. think it ripped one of my, part of the rotator cuff, you know, with those muscles there. Oh, that's enough of that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the horror. The horror. Yeah. On the subject yeah, of horror, right. on the subject of horrifying things, what were, what the fuck were we reading this week? <laughs> what the fuck oh were we God. reading this week? Please let me just, uh, if I do that, we were reading The Wind in the Rosebush by Mary, I can't remember names, I'm absolutely rubbish at this bit of it, uh, Mary Wilkins Freeman. Mm. Okay, The yeah. Wind in the Rosebush. That's what we were reading. Um, the basic synopsis uh, was uh, a spinster called Rebecca, um travels to a town called Ford, uh Ford Village, in order to retrieve her niece, uh, to get her niece to come and live with her because she has now inherited some money and feels that she's in a good position to be able to look after her niece after her sister had died and her brother-in-law had married someone else. Um, and it had been a year since that had happened, so she had come to get the niece. Now the niece had also turned 16. And so uh, on the journey on the way over, she meets um, uh, a strange woman who can't keep her, who tries desperately not to keep a secret and a even stranger husband who keeps nudging her to tell her to keep the secret. And so you'll start off with this kind of sense of uh, mystery and something horrible has happened. Uh, then you end up at the house uh, where there is uh, plenty of flowers in the garden and one particular rose bush by the door that mysteriously blows when there's no wind around the place. And then we get to meet uh, Mrs. Dent, who uh, has the most maniac smile when she's uh, she stood at the door. And then we spend an entire story of not meeting Agnes, the niece. And some spooky stuff goes off. Did she see Agnes at the top of the stairs? No, she gets told it wasn't. Was that Agnes at the window? Maybe not. Maybe a shadow. Agnes is supposed to be staying with friends. Agnes has gone off to another part of the country. Who's that playing the piano? Who's that playing, you know, the the whole thing going on? No, claims there's nobody there. And as it unfolds and as it goes, there's there's more of this kind of sort of like feeling of not wanting to be in the house. And eventually she goes home. Rebecca goes home demanding that Agnes be sent. Um, And then when she gets home, she hears nothing and she starts writing letters. And eventually she gets a letter back from the postman who used to nudge and say, don't tell any secrets, who then reveals the secrets that Agnes had actually died before Rebecca had even got there. And uh, it looked like it was a known, an open secret that uh, she had died of child neglect. Very good. 
Is that uh, that the story that we read? Absolutely, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. What were your thoughts, Sean? Uh, so, I think when was this written? Uh, good mm-hmm. question. Eighteen. Right, eighteen. Something or other. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Because oh, oh, course, no, it was published in 1903. Right. Okay. Because of course, I think if that was to hit a, a publisher's table at uh, any present time, it wouldn't make it uh, anywhere. Uh, I mean, it's a fair enough story, uh, and and uh, and and it was told with you know a decent pace, and uh, and the foreboding was the, given to us at the beginning. But it, it was kind of all full of like, oh, and oh, M- Mrs. Banks, whatever her name was, uh, she, oh, she, her, her, her lips, um, her lips thinned as she was asked these questions, and then her lips this, and then she leaned on here. And, and I mean, how, how much uh, uh, anxiety and how much uh, can someone hide something throughout that story? I mean, she must have hidden something with her look about 80 times. Uh, so it was good. It was all right, you know, and, and, and it led us to where I thought it was going to lead us at the end. Uh, uh, so I kind of enjoyed it. And now I know it was written in 18, late, the eight, late 1800s. I can see, you know, that um, there would have been some uh, need for that kind of story. And, and I think it would have filled um, a, a, a gap in the horror genre for some, for, for some people. I mean, I completely take on board what you're saying there. Um, I think my issues with this one were that some of the writing was just so lazy and slipshod in the mm. way it was done. It was sort of like dripping in adverbs, which when you've got the audio version of something, um, all you can hear is those L-Y endings banging at you. And the yeah. stupidity of the description. I mean, there was this one part where um, we've got, it was a long ferry. Finally, Rebecca herself waxed unexpectedly loquacious. She turned to the other woman and inquired if she knew John Dent's widow who lived in Ford Village. Her husband died about three years ago, said she by way of detail. The woman started violently. She turned pale, then she flushed, then she cast a strange glance at her husband, who was regarding both women with a sort of stolid keenness. Now, with that part, you've got her going... Yeah, yeah. yeah, All in this fucking carriage, and this Rebecca is so thick-witted, it's just a case of, oh, she's having a bit of a funny turn, and I'm not even going to think about it. Yeah, and he's doing sort of like the, oh, beware of the village, there's sort of like... Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just... Yeah, it was. It, it was painted rather thickly. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was done more as a yeah as a comic book rather than photorealism. And I think well, so. yeah. I, I mean, nowadays, if we're going to write something like that, where's the twist? Where's the twist? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, in fairness, I did enjoy the abruptness of the ending. I like the fact that they just... <laughs> yeah, and that was it. There was no more. And you just think, oh, right, yeah. Yeah, good, done and dusted. But yeah. Yeah, that's what you're expecting from this story. But yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Colin, are you? Are we on the same page, or are you thinking, no, nah, it's one of my female writers here. She's weird and wonderful. I I decided to look into some of the history of the story in order to try and see if I could get anything out of it. Because to be brutally honest with you, I think the two of you are being rather kind to it. Yeah. I thought it was dreadful. You are very kind people. I did, honestly, I, I thought it was dreadful. I thought it was, to start with, I thought it's almost the story of the Wood of the Dead, but told with a lot less quality. And, to, and for such a heavyweight writer as well, because she's one of the very um, first female writers to ever be indoctrinated into a particular Hall of Fame in America. Um, wow. And, you know, she... she, she is so highly regarded. I see this a little bit like when we when we dissed Dickens for The Signal Man, in that, you know, uh, uh, I haven't read any other of her work, but apparently her work is considered to be some of the great Victorian writing from America, from Victorian writing. But I don't see any of that here in this story at all. I thought there were some nice scenes. I love the maniac smile when she first meets Mrs. Dent. And Mrs. Dent sort of almost has a stroke in the way that it's, it's done. Oh, yeah. I just... 
and I could see that bit of it, and then it just got tedious again. Like you say, it's the amount of adverbing of the dialogue was just distracting. Um, I liked the piano playing. I thought that was quite nice. Um, you know, it was the Maiden's March that was being played. And when you when you read into the history of it and the fact that they were Puritarians and it was a Puritarian village that they were supposed to, she was supposed to be going to, then the Maiden's March and the whole idea of she liked boys, mm, she did. She used to like hanging around with boys, you know, was kind of and disparaging to her to the to Agnes's character made some sort of sense. But it was just done and i don't know whether it was lazy i don't know if she just didn't know how to do that particular type of story um like i say the whole letter after a year thing is what made me think of the wood of the dead you see because yeah. that ended the same way of he disappeared yeah. he went away and came back again and then found out who had died and that it was ghosts that he'd seen yeah, yeah. but no it just I, I i tried i tried reading it and I think I fell asleep after about four pages and I thought, right, I'll try the audio book. And then the audio book, I kept drifting away from it because there were so many um, redundant words that didn't add to the atmosphere. I, I love old words. Ash will tell you, I mess about with old words all the time, but only when they create an atmosphere, when it's right. And that's what that guy did with the, the Wood of the Dead. He used the language yeah. in a beautiful way that conjured the imagery, where this was almost like using the language in such an ugly way mm -hmm. that it, it was it just added nothing to the story at all. And I'm yeah. sorry to I'm sorry to say that to all the all the fans of um, Freeman's work, but yeah. I don't think this is a great example of it. I think uh, she she could have possibly come up with a story while she was waiting for the um, four or nine to take it to Rochdale. <laughs> <laughs> you know you could have you could have easily come up with that story it just it, it, yeah it it had nothing to hold on to did it it wasn't like no. quite often you you can read a ghost story and it might have a certain amount of genericness about it <coughs> but it will always have that kind of oh you can kind of see where the idea came from because they were sat outside a scary house or they were on a train station on their own and that's where the story would have come up from but mm. this almost reads like someone said, can you write me a ghost story, please? And she sat in a bright sunshine garden going, hmm, how do you write a ghost story? Oh, I know. We'll do it this way rather than having any inspiration. Yeah, I think yeah, part absolutely. of me that annoyed me whilst I was reading it was the fact that we've got so many disparate parts in there that have got no relationship to one another. You've got sort of like, the reason why it's called the wind in the rose bush is because they walk past a rose bush and sometimes spookily it dithers or vibrates as though there's a wind going through it. I didn't see what relationship that had with the fact that this child is either dead or ghost or missing or whatever. Um, yeah. We've got the fact that she's actually died of neglect. Um, it doesn't actually sound like she's neglected throughout the story. Um, it sounds like she's fannying around with friends, having fun, um, being cared for. She's got clothes there that they're looking after. So, yeah, there's no relationship between any of the parts that are in there. Um, and no. this one who supposedly fucking cares enough to come and get this kid back um, has not been in contact with them for a year. Um, it just, yeah. Well, it, that's the thing is that is addressed but so badly that you hardly notice. She does actually say she had been writing for a year with no response. And that's why she suddenly went on the journey. And even they said, we only got your letter yesterday. She wrote to say that she was coming and Mrs. Dent said, but we only got your letter yesterday. You know, so there is kind of addressed in there, but I agree with you completely is that you've got this mechanism of the rose bush, which is being foregrounded in the title of the actual piece. But then it doesn't really, the most the, the most connection it has is later on when the rose is found on the bed upstairs with the nightgown. Yeah. You know, where actually you would think in that sort of thing that maybe there would be some sort of communication with the ghost where the rose bush is the last thing she saw before she died or yeah. the rose bush is where she had the happy memories or the rose bush was the last thing that her mother bought her. But, you know, none of that was there. And it's all, yeah. Uh, all the ghosts that are, that would have um, conveyed to, uh, to is it Rebecca? Yes. Uh, conveyed to Rebecca somehow that she was completely uh, not in a nice house, uh, you know, and, and, it, and, it, and it's Mrs. Dent has caused my death. And then it could have, 
then she would have known and gone back to Mrs. Dent with a completely different agenda, trying to work out um, just how she's going to get out of there, uh, you know, and I'm with the murderer now, and, you know, so things would change. That would have been more interesting. Yes, yeah, it would. Yeah. Well, well, what we were left with was actually Rebecca being completely gaslighted by this this crazy woman with no evidence that that's what's going on until the very last bit. And, and I'm not sure whether the author was going, oh, this will make people think the whole thing is a lie. Everything that comes out of Mrs. Dent's crazy, twisted mouth is a lie. Mm. But there's nothing to tell you that. It's, it's like the murder mystery, isn't it, where the murderer comes in in the last paragraph and you yeah. have no chance of solving it on the way. Mm. There's no clues. There's no clues at all to what has happened, apart from you know. You know in the first paragraph that the, the niece is dead. You know that before anything happens. But yeah. then there's no clues to how any of that happened. You're just, you know, mm. it, there's no signposting or anything. Uh. And yeah, and, and the postmaster and his wife that they meet on board the ferry or the carriage or wherever the chuff it is, um, the fact that they're not going to tell her anything. Why the fuck not? That's just, that's just a pointless character that's yeah. existing there for no reason. I mean, if any of us were sort of like sat on a bus, and um, and not that I'm suggesting either of you two are bus wankers, but we're sort of like sat on a bus, there's um, somebody sitting opposite us um, and saying, oh, I'm going to go and see um, Mrs. Smith and Dead Kid. Um, and yeah, we're sort of like there. Each one of us would go, Oh, about Dead Kid, had you heard? You know, we don't want to break the bad news, but it's not like we're really happy about this. But also, yeah, you wouldn't send somebody off like that. It just seems unreal and yeah, inhuman. Yeah, and also, Very poorly written. from a storytelling point of view, if, if she goes, knocks on the door like she's taking someone a sandwich, completely innocent, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, which is what she does. But if she were to be told something, just to make her think, oh, okay. So she knocks on the door differently, different story unfolds. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's obvious. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a um, really, really disappointing story. Uh, <laughs> it's almost as though that's underscoring my uh, thesis um, that um, women weren't able to write horror stories back then. Yes, I, I mean, I've managed to disprove that a couple of times, but this one definitely falls in your camp. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. I, I think I'm the, gonna, devil, the yellow gonna... wallpaper was great. Sorry, what was that, Sean? The yellow wallpaper was great. She could write. Oh, the yellow wallpaper was great. The, 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 mummies, the mummy's curse was great. Yeah. The werewolf was great. Yeah. I really enjoyed those. We did. Yeah. We did have a. I thought the nurse's story was was okay. It was half a good story. We agreed on that one. But yeah. the open door, the opening door was a brilliant one. We both agreed that that was fantastic. Yeah, one, it was. One first. So we're we're actually still in. You know, yeah, women, um, uh, uh, scoring much higher than you would expect. I was very worried expect, about the hand gestures you were making there, but yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> women, 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 yeah. Oh, uh, we're going right back to. Cosmo small face. Yeah, bloody are, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so you looked into some of the history behind this one, Colin. Yeah, well, that's where I got the Puritarian stuff from, because it doesn't right. strike me as that at all. And then you kind of read into it and you're going, it's it's all based around the, uh, around the Puritarians. And that's what everything was going on about, about the sort of like marrying again and the village itself. The footnotes in the in the the printed version I've got say that Ford Village actually existed, but probably not the one that she was writing about, which confused me a little bit of why that would even be in a footnote. But um, I was looking at um, some of the some of the sort of stuff from it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was puritarianism. Puritarianism was the main part of it, and the main the the idea that somebody was talking about was the main theme of this story. Is supposed to be the lying. Not, not the ghost, and so it's supposed oh, to be a story about Mrs. Dent's manipulations. Oh, I see. Going on, um, of which case I would say it failed at that because I don't think that really comes across at all. There's, there's like you said, there's no signposting. All there is is you've got Rebecca running around the place trying to find stuff out and never speaking to anyone else properly. Ooh. about anything and this one woman yeah. going, oh she's she's across the road at the neighbors 
You know, I mean, even to the point where she got the letter, hasn't she? So Mrs. Dent has gone okay. out and posted a letter. Yeah. You know, so she she's obviously very, you know, um, you know, very aware of everything going on and trying to manipulate the situation. Mm. And that is very manipulative. But it's only after the story that you mm. actually you think, oh, something obviously odds going on but there's nothing to tell you that that is absolute at that point it's missing a vital piece of information yeah uh, unless this was written for people of you know that lived in temp in uh, temp, a world of temperance you know and 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 you know and, and devout christians or catholics or whatever you want to call people you know where of course lying back then would have been a completely different story i, well, I would have thought probably um, more shocking yeah, I, th I still think if even even nowadays, if you had what you needed as a reader was absolute proof that the child was dead so that you understood the lying going on. So you needed information that the, 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 the protagonist didn't have, which is how you work in a murder mystery. Quite often you will give the reader a piece of information that the detective doesn't have so that you're one step ahead. And yeah. in this, that doesn't happen. You kind of, I think that's what she's trying to set up at the beginning, but does mm. it so badly that you almost don't care and think mm. you just wish the postmaster and his wife would bloody cop it and that there's some mass murders going on. But the, but I think that's what that's what's needed. As a reader, it's almost like the Columbo side of things. As a reader, you needed to know absolutely one hundred percent that the uh, that Mrs. Dent was lying from the moment she opens the door, or you needed to be so ingrained in Rebecca's character, in which case it should have been written in the first person, that you're not sure whether she's going mad or not. Mm. And it doesn't do either of those things, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So yeah. there was bound to be a duffer, really, <laughs> you know, along the line. And, uh, but, and yeah. I, guess, I guess this flags up as a, a duffer. Yes. Yeah, uh, definitely, yeah, I wouldn't be... Um, you'd said that, uh, yeah, Sean, you'd said um, <laughs> that it was related to the temperance movement. Um, and my <laughs> thoughts were, um, I'm not going to be fucking sober if I read this one again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but oh, yeah. Um, uh, um, oddly, I'm going to say this oddly. I could actually see how you could film it and make it a very, very scary story. Go on. Right. There's the weird thing about it is the way that it was done with the whole piano playing and the, did you see this at the top? I actually think if you did film it from that point of view of is she mad or not? And creating the whole gaslighting and creating that whole kind of what happened to baby Jane feel about the whole movie as a two-hander, I think you could actually make that work as a really, really scary piece. Uh, yeah. yeah I, it's got the I, I, I think the murder weapon would have had to have been... Uh, uh, introduced somewhere i think the illness needs to be mrs dent as well i think not just the holding back of the medicine yeah, i think yeah. it should be the whole almost munchausen yeah, syndrome yeah. stuff going on yeah yeah i get you oh well, yeah i can see that working it'd be, yeah. it'd be, it'd be great to do as a two-hander to actually be one of the actors in it. it would be great you could do it though couldn't you? and you'd have to you'd have to work on it a lot to make them make the rose bush more of a device you know, yeah. the boat. There are bones there to do a good story. I just don't think yeah. it was done by the per the right person. Yeah, and you could also see it as a very funny uh, Steve Coogan mistake. <laughs> I'm thinking more <laughs> French and Saunders. <laughs> yeah, Jennifer Saunders. Yeah, yeah, It'd be a great mistake. Actually, she would. Jennifer Saunders would be absolutely. Br I think Jennifer Saunders would be brilliant as Mrs. Dent. Yeah, yeah, she would. And Dawn she French would. as Rebecca. Yeah. She's very funny. I've watched her the other day on the TV. She was in uh, uh, a film that I watched, a Poirot film, and the new yeah, the one. Death on the Nile. Yeah, yeah. She was in that, and she's always fascinating me. She speaks, but her lips don't seem to move at all. <laughs> How did she do that? <laughs> <laughs> the next time you see her, just watch. She doesn't yeah. move. Yeah, I mean, Keith Harris used to be able to do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Maybe she's talking for Dawn French as well. Yeah. Maybe that's what she's doing. Yeah. Have we seen them both in the same room before? <laughs> well, I, I thought that was inspired casting, casting those two. 
as yeah. the companions on the on the Death yeah. on the Nile. I thought it was. Yeah, and I wasn't. I wasn't quite so sure myself. I I would have preferred it being two people that I personally feel like I didn't know. And, and same with Russell Brand as well. I, I thought it was a bit cheap, really. That was a weird. We actually spent, I think, five minutes of the movie discussing whether or not it was Russell Brand because yeah, he right. he spent so much of the time not talking. Yeah, but he was good in it. I, yeah. I won't take that away from him. I, I just thought it was a bit cheap casting, you know. Yeah, I loved it. I thought it was great. I I, I really yeah, really enjoyed it as a as a version yeah. of the film. Of the, the and story. anything with anything where Kenneth Branagh is involved is right yeah. at the top. Right at the top. Anything with him and, and anything to do with Agatha Christie for me at the minute? Uh, I've got Agatha Christie nuts. Uh, I watched him do uh, his production of Macbeth in the church in the Northern Quarter in Manchester. Oh, it was amazing. I do I like Kenneth Branagh, but when I saw the production of Hamlet that he did, I thought his Hamlet was a little bit asthmatic because it was just sort of like, <sighs> to be or not to be, that is... Uh, yeah, it was... Uh, but yeah, um, it was obviously different people playing it different ways. Uh, my favorite yeah. one, David yeah. Tennant, I just thought he nailed it beautifully. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm, right. Am I meant to name another book now? Then another story. Um, yeah, let's go for that. I think we're, uh, we're 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 sans tangent at the moment. So if you name another one, we can go off on that one. I think uh, as a sum up, just on this last one as a sum up, I think I'd like to sum it up as. There are the bones of a classic ghost story there, but not the story of a classic ghost story, if you know what I mean. Not the writing of a classic ghost story, I uh, think. Um, I, yeah, my sentiments, I uh, yeah, my sentiments on this one are that I think um, that this author um, should not be trusted with writing or with parallel parking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure she can make a good sandwich. Is that what you're saying, Ash? That's what, yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. Um, and, yeah, um, and hopefully to um, stop myself sounding like a misogynistic prick, I want a Gertrude Atherton story for next week. Um, the Striding Place. Atherton. Gertrude Atherton. There aren't enough people called Gertrude nowadays. No. Your name. It's often cows. Yeah, I mean, in that story, one of the good things that I could say about that was we've got a character called Agnes. And, yeah, um, I think... Agnes no, we had a character called Agnes until the story started. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right, yeah. yes. So, yeah, The Striding Place, Gertrude Atherton. Can I have a year on that one, actually? Um, year was it um, published? Do you know? No, I don't. Um, All right, we'll forget that one, then. We'll find out next week. Yeah, uh, but... Yeah. Um, Probably during the wartime thing. Um, hold on. Yeah, I'll find out for you now. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, right. Oh, wow. 1896. Nice. Wow. Great. Yep. So a similar time to our last book then. Yeah. 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 I mean, a lot, of these, a lot of these weird tales, as we've been reading them, we're finding quite a few of them around that turn of the century. Are coming yeah. in, you start thinking, Oh, this must be later. I was so surprised when we read Pigeons from Hell how early that was, you know. And, and when you're reading it, you're thinking, Oh, it's going to be, it's got to be 40s going into 50s, and it wasn't, it was right back. And mm. you know. I guess the um, I guess the advent of printing was uh, in full flow in 1896 as well. Yeah, we've got magazines, and stuff like got your magazines for the cultured and the educated and for the um, languishing classes. Yes, yeah. 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 Capitalism had got full hold of the art of the art form at that point, massively. Yeah, well, at least people were reading. Yes, well, they didn't have any TV to watch. You see. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, it wasn't mm. Netflix, it wasn't Netflix and chill back then. No, no, it's not Netflix and chill in my house either. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find a film on Netflix that's any good. Um, um yeah, I, I I've watched a few on there which I quite enjoyed. Oh it's really film. weird. If you want to watch a very weird series that's uh, it's completely out there and would never make it on mainstream, there's a, a, fil a TV series called Russian Doll. Right. And it's just done, its second series has just come out. I haven't seen the second series yet. But the first series is basically about this woman who keeps repeating her 32nd, uh, 36th birthday. Right. So it's a bit Groundhog Day. But 
it's very sweary and very drug orientated right. and very strange New Yorky type stuff. I loved it. I started watching it thinking what is going on here. And then it just the way the story just unfolded and the way that she kept dying every day was just brilliant. So I'm looking forward yeah. to the second series of that one. Yeah, uh, yeah, good. That's music for me. Yeah. Have you watched the Sparks documentary yet? No. Sparks. Oh, the Sparks one. No, I haven't. I was yeah, Edgar Wright directed. That's on Netflix. Yeah, I was uh I was talking about that with somebody, uh, uh but I haven't got around to seeing it, so I've just written it down again. Yeah, that was that was great. I like I must admit, I do like my uh I do like my music an awful lot and my music documentaries in particular. Yeah, yeah, love it, love it. Okay, guys. Right, so hey. that's what we've got for next time. Right, so there we go. Um, yeah. Crap story this week. Let's hope that next week's... Have you, have you read this one? Or have you just picked off a list, Ash? Um, I've read it. I used it as part of my thesis. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is I don't know whether you're going to use it as the example of what is good short yeah. story writing or were you using it as an example of now not to do yes. short story yeah. writing. So I'm going to have to wait and see. Yes. <laughs> He's using it to catch up. To catch up with the with crap lady writers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I've really enjoyed this, guys. Thank okay. you. See you next week. Cheers. Love you. Bonjour. Bonjour.